Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is the rule of God, that is God's kingdom, His personal rule in our lives through Jesus Christ. And we've been looking at what call does the kingdom of God give us? What does God want us to do with the kingdom? How does He want us to respond to the personal rule of God in our lives? We've seen that means He calls us to repent, to turn away from the old things, put our trust in Christ. And now we're going to go on from there and look at the call of a disciple of Jesus. Now the Greek word for disciple is mathetes, which literally means learner. And the word that corresponds to that, it is rabbi in the Aramaic, or didaskolos in the, in the Greek. So, Rabbis had their followers, their learners, their disciples. And uh, Jesus broke with tradition. Rabbinical tradition was that the disciples chose the master. They enrolled in the school voluntarily, rather like you've enrolled in the school yourself. But Jesus didn't do that. He transformed it. He said, I will choose my disciples. And he went and did did just that. Come, follow me. And he is calling people to follow him, choosing disciples. Now, mathetes comes from manthano, which means to learn. And it shows that reflective thought, which is where we think of learning, must also be accompanied by actually doing something. So you are in a school today. You're doing something. You're listening. But that's not learning. That's not discipling. Teaching, teaching you what and giving you information is part of it. You are going to be taught more once you finish listening to me teaching than you're being taught now by me listening because the Holy Spirit, by me speaking, because the Holy Spirit is your teacher. You are in the school of discipleship. And this is one part of it. As I'm teaching you and imparting information, the Holy Spirit's working in you, and you won't have got through those doors before he will be starting to apply this truth in your life. And you've got to understand, following Jesus isn't just about stuffing your head full of facts about Jesus. Yes, I know now, mathetes means to learn. I am a learner. I learned that, therefore, I am a disciple. No, you are a tape recorder. What this means is you are to learn from Jesus personally. It means to become like him. When a disciple is fully taught, the disciple becomes like the master. And so Jesus starts this lesson very early. He says, come follow me. What now? Yes, leave those nets, leave those boats, leave your business, leave your, uh, uh, your, 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 what you're doing now and come and follow me. And that's as true for them as, as, as true for us as it was for them. Now, it doesn't mean to say people leave their profession in order to become a Christian, but you have to forsake everything and put him first and above everything else. So, again, notice this. By saying, follow me, Jesus isn't saying, follow laws, follow teachings, follow regulations. He says, follow me. And this is personal, not legalistic. And so it's very clear then how the concept of discipleship follows on from the biblical understanding of repentance and faith. Jesus calls us to learn, him person, learn from him personally. That's true discipleship. Doesn't call us to follow a set of ideas or rules, but to follow him. Doesn't call us to learn from a law or a book, but rather to learn from himself. And that, of course, is very clear in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we are called to follow him and to learn from him personally and to become like him. The call is personal. Also, the call is urgent. You get that from the proclamation of Jesus. In fact, the very way that the gospel comes through proclamation suggests an urgency. Jesus proclaims, he calls out, the time has fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent. Believe in the gospel. The way in which the gospel, the, the gospel is preached, the way in which this news is communicated by preaching suggests an urgency. And when you move and minister and grow and develop in your preaching and teaching ministry, remember, there's an urgency in the proclamation. Now, there are many people who are called to follow Jesus to become disciples, but in every instance, the call is an urgent one. He asked people to respond when he called them. Even if that response meant considerable disruption to them and to their lives and to the people around them. Here, in the calling of the early disciples, they had to leave everything. Matthew was sitting there at, in his, at his desk as a customs officer taxing the people. He had to leave it. He just left it right there. What about the people in the queue? The rich young man. Jesus said, leave everything and follow me. Right now, come on, do it. He wasn't willing. In another case, he said to somebody, I, I must just go and, and bury my father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. This is even more urgent than a funeral because of your funeral. That's why it's urgent. I'm not saying that we run out of funerals and don't attend funerals because we're Christians. Of course not. But what he, Jesus is saying there is that the call of the kingdom is more urgent than anything else in your life, more urgent than anything else in your life. Now we can see in these stories that from the Gospels that these people began immediately to follow Jesus. Others, some did, others made excuses and didn't. But the call, this shows us that the call of the kingdom is compelling but not compulsory. In, in other words, you are not forced to do it. You have your choice. God wants you to respond in love. Now, you all know that, don't you? From how you became a Christian. When you believed in Jesus, he waited for that moment until you were willing to say yes. Do you remember that time? You had to say yes. He worked so that you were willing to say yes. That's why many people come to Christ in difficult times because he's putting the pressure on to bring you to the point where you are willing to acknowledge him. You remember that, don't we? Many of us. That's how you came into the kingdom. And that's how it continues to be. He never comes to you forcing you to obey him. He comes gently, tenderly, persistently. He sometimes speaks strongly and loudly, and sometimes he deals with you severely in order to make you willing, but you have to be willing. Now, let, listen to this. If that's how you came into the kingdom, that's how you live in the kingdom, that's how you go on in the kingdom. Did you know that? That means you have in your life now as much of the kingdom of God as you want. How many people say, I want more? It's a serious question. How many, how many people say, I want more of the kingdom of God in my life? Lift your hand. Nearly everybody's hands up. Now I know what you mean. I, I would put my hand up too. I know what you mean. I want more. But let me tell you, the truth is this. Both you and I have as much of the kingdom of God in our lives at this point as we want. Because we have as much of the kingdom of God as we have chosen to receive. 
Think about it. Living in the kingdom is not just about saying, I've made up my mind to become a Christian, to be in the kingdom of God so I can see the kingdom of heaven so that I won't die and go to hell. Living in the kingdom means you take every step that God has for you in the kingdom and you receive more and more and more and more. It all depends on your willingness. And so there is an urgent call in this. Don't ever lose your urgency in the kingdom. And yet Christians do. Why is it that in Great Britain and Western Europe, Christianity is decreasing in so many ways? Because the church is backslidden. Because we have forgotten the urgency of the call of the kingdom. And we thought, we've got our tickets to heaven, that's it. I've got my ticket, my passport, that's right. But you have to pack. You've got to get ready. What are you going to take with you? The only thing you can take with you is what you do for Jesus in this life. Get ready is the call. And that doesn't mean just to say, I'm a believer, therefore I'm ready. Get ready means do the will of God on the earth. So that when the kingdom comes and Christ returns, you will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Keep that urgency of the kingdom, that radical call of the kingdom. Keep it upon your heart and mind every day of your life. Wake up in the morning and say, Here I am, Lord. This is a new day, a day for the kingdom of God. I'm going to live for you 100%. What changes do you want in my life today? Speak to me. You are the Lord. I am the servant. You are the master. I am the slave. You are the potter. I am the clay. He wants us to follow him, but he will not make us. And he will not allow us to follow him if we do not follow him on his terms, in his way, and in his timing. You can miss the moment of the Lord. Did you know that? Just as it's possible for the Lord to call and call somebody to be saved and they so harden their heart that that person then, as is what we call, becomes gospel hardened and they never, ever get saved because they get so hardened to the message. So it is that God can be speaking to some of you about your prayer life which is upon my spirit right now calling you to a life of intercession in the secret place, calling you to repent of sins in your life which you know you're holding on to, and repeatedly he's saying, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. There can come a moment, as it happened to the people in the wilderness in Israel's day, that he will say, you're not going to enter my rest, and you'll go on wandering in the wilderness, still in bondage to that thing, still never breaking free from prayerlessness, never being effective in your life as a believer, never rising up for your destiny, never receiving the full ministry that Jesus has for you, never progressing in the things of God. Yes, saved, out of Egypt, but not into Canaan. The call is urgent. The call also is conclusive. <laughs> you can't get more conclusive than death. And the call of the kingdom is carry your cross and die. Yes, I see that hand. Your cross is waiting for you at the front. Yes, I see that hand. The nails are here ready for you. To follow Christ means to carry your cross and to die. There can be no looking back. Jesus said in Luke 9 verse 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There can be no looking back. And if there's no looking back, there's no turning back. If you start looking back, you will turn back. Never look back. Always look ahead. And what is the importance of looking ahead when you're plowing a field? If you don't know what that is, you've never plowed a field especially this way, you know, being a, a, a horse or, or an ox or something, is pulling the plow. And you've got to have your eye fixed 
firm ahead to cut a straight line. You, d you turn away, you turn aside, that line gets crooked and you end up not plowing the field and the farmer will have you. Jesus said, you put your shoulders to the plow, you set a straight course for your life, you keep your eyes on Jesus and you cut that furrow firm and deep and straight. You can't let that pressure go for one moment. You've got to put your shoulders to that plow to keep that plow in place. Listen, the ox is plowing. The ox is pulling. You are not. Jesus said, take my yoke on you. He is the one who's leading you. He is the one who's guiding you. He is the one who's strengthening you. He is the one who's delivering you. You're following him, but you put your shoulder to that plow so that plow remains steady. That's your responsibility. Keep it steady, lad. That's your responsibility. That means you keep the focus of your life totally on the issue of discipleship. You are not distracted for one moment. You can be absolutely sure of this. The devil will take advantage of that moment. He will wait until you just relax just for one moment in that thing. No wonder Jesus had to encourage us and say, now relax, don't worry. The, the burden's upon me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Amen? Now in Matthew, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 33, Jesus says that he must not be disowned before men. In John 8, 31, he says, you must hold to my teaching. And so becoming a follower of Jesus is not just an emotional response or a mental ascent that lasts for a short time. It's a permanent decision to follow Jesus and to learn from him and to keep close to him. Needless to say, as soon as we acknowledge that, we understand that this call for discipleship is a costly call. Jesus said, forsake everything and follow me. They had to leave it all behind. That's what he means by dying. Let it all go. A dead man has no more interests. So we are dead to this world and we take up the cross and ensure that on a daily basis we die to this world so that we can live for the kingdom of God. In Luke 5, verse 11, after the miraculous catch of fish, it said there of the disciples that they forsook all and followed him. Can you imagine this? They just had achieved their career goal. They caught such a miraculous catch of fish that the nets broke and even the boats that were loading the fish were beginning to sink. There was that much fish, to use a gambling term, they had hit the jackpot. And I know in my own life that when God called me to follow him and serve him in full-time Christian work and ministry, there was a delay in his instructions, or at least, you know, stay where you are for the moment. I was ready to go, I was ready to go at that moment, and I didn't particularly want to pursue my dancing career because I didn't want to get so in love with it that I couldn't leave it. And yet, and I had at second touch from Jesus, and he said, now is the moment. I was on the threshold of a breakthrough in my career that would have given for me a partnership with the senior dancer of the female dancer of the company, and it would have meant for me five principal roles in the next season, a sure and certain promotion, including two ballets that were going to be written especially for me. And then he said, it's time. <laughs> Hallelujah. These people had entered the water. They'd fished all night, caught nothing. Their career was at the lowest ebb. And then Jesus shows up and he blesses them. And now they have more than enough to live off and possibly even retire from. They could just sell this business up and then live off it. They were now absolutely at the pinnacle point of their human earthly ambitions. And then Jesus said, leave it all, which included leaving that fish behind. I wonder if they said, oh boy, we just made it. Now there's thousands of bucks worth here. What? A but the master calls. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, 
Time and time again, vast crowds and multitudes went with Jesus. They were curious. They were interested, even fascinated. They were dazzled by the miracles, but they were not committed and they'd not counted the cost. The same is true today, even without so many miracles. And Jesus said to them in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 to 33 is the full passage. So the vast multitudes that went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So the essence of being a disciple was missing from these multitudes. They had not reflected carefully enough or thought carefully enough about what was involved in following Jesus. And the way in which we present the gospel today, I'm talking about the current modern church, not me or we in this church or in this ministry, but the way it's often presented is, is come to Jesus and get your problems solved. Come to Jesus and he'll give you fulfillment. Come to Jesus and he'll get your marriage sorted out. Come to Jesus and he'll heal your body. Come to Jesus, you'll have nice feelings, you'll have peace and love and joy. Come to Jesus. Who wouldn't come to Jesus on those terms? But they are not the terms of the gospel. Oh yes, they are the fringe benefits. Oh yes, they are the blessings of the gospel, but they are not the terms of the gospel. The terms of the gospel is this. Come to Christ and die. And in those days, <laughs> Jesus wasn't speaking too metaphorically either. Jesus was going to be crucified. And if that's how they treat me, he said, what are they going to do to you? And in these days, even now as I speak, and people are hearing this in the broadcasts and the videos, you know of the deaths that take place across the world. Parts of the world to believe in Jesus and to convert to him and be baptized means you lose your head. Oh yes, they think very, very carefully before they accept Jesus Christ. Many parts of the world, you have to preach this. Come to Jesus and you'll have death threats. Come to Jesus, you will lose your marriage. Come to Jesus, and you will lose provision for your body. Come to Jesus, you will have no job. Come to Jesus, you'll be persecuted. You may even be killed. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed. I've been in situations when I've preached the gospel in, a, in, a, in the open air, and at the end of that gospel service, when they had, in that evangelistic mission, when they had secret police in the congregation, uh, mixing with the crowds, those names were taken. We had to get people out of the city that very night, or else they would be killed. Now, I'm not suggesting that has to be the case every time we preach the gospel. Thank God, in many ways, there is relative freedom to preach the gospel here in Europe. But that freedom is being eroded. We have got to get back, friends, to what following Jesus is all about. It's forsaking everything and following him. It's putting the kingdom first. It's seeking God's rule first of all, which means that our faith um, uh, comes before our finances uh, that, and our spiritual life comes before our bodily needs even. Of course, God provides for us, but even if it means suffering and death, we will follow him. So Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and this must be done according to Luke 9, 23, every day. And so these words were spoken to those who had already begun to follow Jesus, who had seen God work powerfully through him in signs and wonders and miracles, who now needed to grasp that there was a deeper level of truly following Jesus. Where is Jesus going? If you're following him, where is he going? He's going to rejection. He's going to the cross. He's going to Calvary. That's where Jesus is going. And if you're following him, you will go there as well. That's why Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Because to follow him to the cross means to follow him through the cross and into the resurrection, that we receive new life. Oh, the call was follow me and be free. 
But the freedom meant freedom from self. It meant self-sacrifice. To be a disciple is to say every day, death to self. You should chant that every time you go to bed and every time you get up in the morning. Hallelujah, death to self, death to self, death to self. You should write placards. You should get a demonstration going. Death to self. This is not a set of rigorous, religious, ascetic exercises. It's instead being aware of yourself and aware only. So being unaware of yourself and being aware only of Jesus. It's putting Christ's will in place of your will. It's crossing out the I with the cross of Jesus. That's how the cross should appear to you. The I is crossed out. Not I, but Christ. Now this is painful. But we cannot be blind to the path that God calls us. That path is too steep for us. Yes, it is. We cannot be deaf to the pain that is to come. But we know that he's leading us into life and life everlasting. When we follow Christ, we must show that we mean death to self by taking up our God-ordained cross, our God-offered cross. This is not some ailment or difficulty or even persecution. This is sacrifice of yourself. It means hardship and rejection for the sake of Christ. It means saying no to self, and it means saying yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? That's the call of the kingdom. And we must stop right here and now. But we're going to come back again. And we're going to pick up from this point. We're going to see how the Holy Spirit will take us deeper and deeper into the things of Christ, into the things of the kingdom. God bless you. I do hope that you've enjoyed this teaching on the kingdom of God today and that you've felt the power of God's kingdom in your life. After all, the kingdom of God is the only kingdom that is really worth extending. First of all, in your life and then through your life to the others around you. We'll be back next time for more teaching on the kingdom of God.